I'm Amanda Piquet. Welcome to this series on Neuroimmunology Nuggets. Neuroimmunology Nuggets is an educational program that was developed with patients in mind to provide a focused or digestible topic uh, in neuroimmunology and autoimmune neurology. For this particular episode, we will be discussing LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis. We've reviewed in a prior episode of autoimmune encephalitis, what is encephalitis? Briefly, as a recap, encephalitis is inflammation that directly affects the tissue of the brain. This often causes symptoms of memory or cognitive dysfunction, personality changes, and sometimes seizures. This inflammation can be caused by different reasons, with the two most common forms of encephalitis from infection or autoimmune disease. In the setting of autoimmune disease, the immune system causes an inflammatory response and development of an autoantibody that can go on and attack your brain. So with that in mind, let's move on to limbic encephalitis. Limbic encephalitis is a very specific type of autoimmune encephalitis that causes inflammation of the limbic system. This is located in your temporal lobes of the brain and can cause specific uh, symptoms of short-term memory issues and seizures. Often the MRI is abnormal, showing changes and in inflammation in the bilateral, bilateral temporal lobes. And that is shown here circled in red. Sometimes there's also contrast enhancement on your MRI. And that is shown here in the red uh, with the red arrow. And this is essentially breakdown of the blood brain barrier due to active inflammation. And then we see this contrast enhancement. I also want to discuss uh, the definition of facial brachial dystonic seizures. We'll call this FBDS. Now FBDS is a rare form of epilepsy or seizure disorder characterized by very frequent brief seizures, often affecting the arm and face and sometimes the leg, but not as commonly. These particular seizures have been described as a pathognomonic seizure type for LGI-1 encephalitis. So essentially catching this can sometimes help define this disorder. And I am going to show you a video here. Again, thank you to our patient for allowing us to do this. Um, show you a video of his facial brachial dystonic seizures. He's here in the hospital um, and his seizures are being monitored, which is why he's wearing uh, that cap. And you can see here, these seizures are, and these movements are very, very brief. Uh, on his right side, he kind of grimaced with his face and pulled his right arm up. I will show it again because they can be so brief and hard to catch. And right there it is. So similar to, and MDA receptor encephalitis. LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis has a distinct and often predictable clinical course. Onset, typically either with facial brachial dystonic seizures or the FBDS that I showed in that video, or focal seizures happens. In this pie chart here, highlighted in the green hues, show seizure disorders, uh, accounting for over half of the presenting symptoms. However, there are star, still a large portion of patients that presents with cognitive and behavioral changes, and these are all highlighted here in the blue hues. There is a smaller subset of patients that present uh, with other phenotypes, such as peripheral nervous system problems or sleep issues, and those are in the red and the orange. It's important to recognize that patients that present only with FBDS, if this is recognized early and treatment is initiated, 
we can actually avoid the development of encephalitis. Furthermore, in cases in which patients have the encephalitis or cognitive decline when they present, these cases are often a little bit harder to treat and require second line therapies beyond uh, just steroids, sometimes IVIG or plasma exchange. And often this includes, second line therapies include uh, something such as rituximab. So I'm gonna give you an, a clinical case example of a patient with LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis. This is the case or in a story of a 80 year old man who presented with two weeks of progressive confusion. Uh, to give you an example, his wife actually had to lock him in the house at night because he would get up out of bed and wander around the neighborhood. Some additional symptoms included visual hallucinations and then he developed that twitch brief, or that brief twitching movement of his right uh, face and arm. And it was happening multiple times a day. And I'm talking on the order of sometimes 50 to 100 times a day. And that, those movements were consistent with the facial brachial dystonic seizures. He had uh, additional workup and spinal fluid studies showed some subtle inflammation uh, with nine white blood cells, something we call oligoclonal bands. Um, and then he had LGI-1 antibody testing, which was positive in both the blood and the spinal fluid confirming the diagnosis. He had some other non-specific markers um, of autoimmunity, including positive thyroid antibodies that were present in the blood. But ultimately he was diagnosed with LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis. I do wanna just first orient you to this figure as it shows a brain MRI in um, panel A and panel C. Panel B here shows a example of a brain PET scan. Um, when you look at these images, the right side of the screen is actually the left side of the brain and vice versa. So on panel A, the MRI seen here by my arrow, um, shows some increased or subtle T2 signal or bright areas in this uh, left temporal lobe. Again, this is very hard to see, but in panel B on the PET scan, it is much more obvious with this bright yellow region uh, showing hypermetabolism in that left temporal lobe that corresponds to the subtle abnormalities we see on MRI. Now, panel C shows the image four months after rituximab was initiated. This was actually uh, 12 months after the onset of his symptoms. And you can see here that there's improvement in the bright area seen in the left temporal lobe. However, uh, there is what we call progressive mesial temporal lobe atrophy, which means there's some shrinking down on that left side showing chronic damage after the encephalitis. So this patient was treated in the hospital with acute therapies, including steroids, and uh, immune globulin or IVIG. Six months later, he followed up in clinic. And because of significant memory problems and cognitive problems that were still ongoing, uh, he was started on second line immune therapy with rituximab. And right after that, he began to see improvements of his memory. So we did some memory testing, again, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, when we first met him out of the hospital was uh, seven out of 30. Uh, but um, after starting rituximab that jumped up quickly and by four months, he was at 26 out of 30. The normal value would be considered 27 and above. So he was doing quite well. Um, a year and a half later, he only has very minor symptoms, um, but is otherwise doing quite well. And this course that, that I outlined in this patient presentation is very typical for LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis. Often when immune therapy is started, seizures uh, drop down and decrease pretty quickly. And then you have this slow cognitive uh, improvement. And to some degree, uh, often mild cognitive impairments with residual symptoms left behind Although most patients do return to a near complete neurologic recovery. 
signs of LGI-1 encephalitis at the time of diagnosis are here in the gray box and include low blood sodium or salt levels, changes on that MRI, which I showed you previously. And some may actually have a normal spinal fluid study with only a fraction of patients having abnormal spinal fluid showing inflammation. Cancers are not common with this antibody and only seen in 10% of cases. And with that, I would like to thank you for tuning in to this edition on LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis for our neuroimmunology nugget.